This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, radio host and best-selling author, is my co-host today. You jump in, we'll talk about your life and your money. The Ken Coleman Show is all about careers, jobs, getting one, getting a better one, living in your sweet spot, but doing something of purpose that matters. And uh, Ken can answer questions about all of that kind of stuff. So you jump in and we'll talk about your life and your money and your jobs and your career as part of that equation. 888-825-5225 is the number. That's 888-825-5225. Aaron is in New York City to kick us off this hour. What's up, Aaron? Hey, thanks so much for taking my call. Sure. How can I help? So I am on baby step two. I have about 6,000 in credit cards and a car that's about 10,000 owed. Mm -hmm. And I am coming into some money, about $6,000 from a bonus from my job. And I was curious if you would consider selling the car. I make about 40,000 a year, or if you would just use the 6,000, pay off the credit cards and then pay off the car. B, yes. Use the six thousand, pay off the car. Unless you just hate the car, but uh, uh, no, the car—the no. car is not so an unreasonable car. Given a forty thousand dollar income, a ten thousand dollar car is not an unreasonable car. Okay. We t- I, I take it you're single from the language you're using. Yes. Okay. And so that is your entire household income is forty thousand, and you have a ten thousand dollar car, correct? Yes. Yeah. We tell folks don't have anything with motors, wheels or anything like that added together that equals more than half your annual income because anything with a motor in it uh, goes down in value. And so if all this stuff adds up, you can, in other words, you've got a bunch of dadgum toys in your life and they're all going down in value, you don't have to scratch your head and wonder why you're broke. We know why you're broke. Toys wow. are, in other words, Thank toys you. are fine. They just need to be a good ratio to your income. I got lots of toys, but they're a small percentage of my income. And so you're, you're 25% of your income with this car. So yeah, throw your bonus at your credit cards, dude. Uh, chop them up, continue to work your baby steps, knock that car loan out, and you're going to be sitting in a really, really good shape. Really good shape. So Ken, uh, the job numbers are, you were talking about it before we came on the air. Yeah, and this is a. Um, I thought I knew something. I I'm learning. I knew nothing. I couldn't. I, I, <laughs> I, don't know I mean, about that. I, I've got I, in my mind. I've got states that are wide open, like mm-hmm. our state of Tennessee's wide open, and then you've got, you know, the communist state of California, where everything's shut down by a draconian governor, right? And so I figure the entire economy is just sitting on the sidelines, sitting on their hands in some of these states, and the economy's booming in the other states. But you're saying these numbers coming out the federal numbers coming out across the whole nation blending these different states together obviously and these numbers are the job market is really good it's way better than you think and here's the good news dave these numbers say it's going to absolutely explode in the next few months in the next quarter here's where we are right now end of february 6.7 million private sector jobs were posted that's up from 6.1 million at the end of December. So as we went into the new year, that's how many jobs. So we're seeing a nice trend in private sector jobs that are posted. All right. And here's the way of looking at that. 8% more job openings in February 2021 than there were in February 2020. Now, some of you are going, okay, I'm trying to remember when did COVID shutdown start? Really in March. In the month of February, obviously towards the end of February, we were learning new information and things really ground to a halt in March, Dave. But well, we had negative unemployment in February. 3.4%. Oh, we had 3.4. But that's historical. That was the lowest unemployment rate in the history of the modern era where they really took uh, those, those data and they really crunched it. So we had the greatest unemployment rate, if you will. Uh, not greatest or the lowest, the best that it ever performed. So now we're seeing more jobs. So what we're seeing is the United States economy is creating new jobs. So we lost 40 million jobs in the COVID downturn, right? That's right. 
But now, so what, and the unemployment rate today is what? Low six as well. That's what it was reported last month. We're waiting on those numbers to come out in April. I think you're going to see those numbers drop into the low fives. You might see it in the four. There's no way to really predict that, but based on so these the overall numbers, economy from a jobs perspective has bounced back. It's bouncing back. It's not even finished. Let me tell you where this is happening, Dave. In the areas of manufacturing, pharmacy, construction, and logistics, and think logistics, a lot of technical jobs there, uh, you're seeing 50% growth in jobs. So what's going to happen in the next few months, I think we're going to get very close to where we were in February of 2020, pre-pandemic, where there were more jobs available than there were people who were unemployed. Why does this matter? Well, number one, you're getting a steady diet of negative news all the time, that the sky is falling. Yeah, because I mean, not. I don't even watch the news, and I thought it was worse than this. No. And the second thing is, is understand, folks, there are still a lot of states. Remember, California, New York, New Jersey, just giving you some examples, not a political statement. This is a fact. They're still not fully opened up. And if you look at the hardest hit sector in the American job economy was uh, what we'd call leisure. So that would be your bars, your restaurants, uh, hotels, certainly the airline industry. They're and not back. They're not back. So when we see, hopefully, uh, a full comeback in the summer, I think we're going to see one of the greatest history, uh, greatest periods of job expansion. That means companies offering more jobs. And think of the economy, Dave, and how jobs that didn't exist a year ago. So now what's exist. that mean to a guy that's out there listening who uh, doesn't have a job? It means right you now. better be ready, and that's why you need to come to my get hired event. I just slipped that in there right yeah, there, just, April the twenty yeah. seventh. No, but sure, yeah, that, but I mean, <laughs> it, it, does this mean that well, that guy that's out there doesn't have a job right now? He really should be looking they, and looking different and better because people are hiring, and it's almost it's almost full up. Is exactly right, and it's only going to increase. So this idea—I mean, when it's three point something or four point something unemployment, economists call that full employment. Yes. Even though there's technically people not working, it's like everybody who wants to work is working. And, and to your and point, and some that don't want to work. And here's working. what happens in that situation that we described as last February. People will start to pay you more. The market value for a job goes up. We saw this last year, where young people coming out of college were getting paid more than people that were already on the job and experienced. Why? Because the demand, this is a supply-demand issue, just like in housing or any other commodity. Supply-demand. We are about ready to move into a place where it is going to be a really good environment for the job seeker, for you to get hired and make more money, bigger shovel, get out of debt faster, and position yourself okay, so to pursue the dream job. That also works for not only someone who's sitting there unemployed today, but someone who just wants to change jobs. Yes, sir. A lot hey, of opportunity. A lot of opportunity. I want to make more money. I want to do something different. And so get Getting qualified right now, getting prepared for this, you've got to have your head on a swivel. The job market's heating up, and it's going to get better. And anybody who's intentional about where I want to go, why I want to go there, what I want to do when I get there, right. now's the time. Now let's plug the Get Hired. Yeah, April the 27th, live from our Ramsey Solutions studio. We're going to have a couple hundred people live, uh, multiple it's ticket live prices. Stream. Live stream. Live stream anywhere. Bucks. 20 bucks and to you're start. you're going to walk them through how to get hired. Get clear. Get qualified, get connected so that opportunities knock on your door. You can get the job you want, the job you need, get out of debt, and do work you love. It's going to be a great night. It is Go get your ticket, RamseySolutions.com slash events. Tickets start at 20 bucks. Yeah. Love to see you there. It's a live stream, 20 bucks. You paid more it's than that for lunch. pretty good investment. Paid more than that for lunch. Yeah. Cliff and I joined Christian Healthcare Ministries because we really like the concept of uh, Christians sharing each other's burdens. And we really experienced that firsthand when Cliff was diagnosed with heart disease. It was just such a relief to know that financial burden was going to be taken care of. CHM is the original and longest serving health cost sharing ministry. Get started today and check us out at chministries.org backslash budget.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality again, host of the Ken Coleman Show, doing the Get Hired event. Uh, if you're feeling stuck or disengaged in your current job or you dread getting out of work, out of bed to go to work, then uh, this event is for you. Get Hired live stream event on Tuesday, 27th. At this one night event, you'll learn how to get clear on what you do best, get qualified for the job you want and get connected. Uh, you can join Ken on Tuesday, April the 27th, to take control of your career and start working toward what you were born to do. Tickets start at just $20. Text HIRED to 33789. HIRED to 33789. Our question of the day comes from Blinds.com. They have a 100% satisfaction guarantee. That means even if you screw up or you mismeasure, you pick the wrong color, they'll remake your window blinds for free. Free samples, free shipping, and with new promos all the time, always use the promo code, the magic word, RAMSEY. Today's question comes from Sam in California. He asked, my wife and I have $20,000 saved for a home down payment. I currently work in sales, but I don't know what career path I want to take in the future. Should my priority be figuring out the career question while we have money saved, or should we purchase a home and hope career clarity comes later? Well, this is going to come down to personal preference on this, uh, but I would not necessarily forego buying the house. If you save the money and it's a part of the big plan, I would go ahead and move forward on it. The only exception to that, Dave, uh, would be uh, when you ask these four questions about getting qualified. You know, you got to get clear first, but once we get clear, and that could take some time, you got to ask yourself, all right, so what education do I need? This does not necessarily mean a four-year degree or graduate level degree. This could be a certification, uh, some basic training that would, again, qualify you to do the work you want to do. Could be getting your real estate license. Could be that. There's a cost associated. So the education question is the first thing. What do I need to learn? The second question is the experience question. What experience do I need? The third question is the economic question. How much is it going to cost me if I've got to go get some experience? I've got to go get some education. And then the fourth question is based on that third economic question is what's my expectation for how long this is going to take? That's how we come up with a plan. Now, if Sam does this and he, he gets clarity and he realizes, okay, I'm going to need about five to 7,000 to get qualified to do it. He's got a couple options. They could delay uh, putting the down payment on the home and use some of that, or they could go ahead and buy the home and then save up. It's going to take some time anyway. So that's what I mean by it, it's kind of a, it depends. But in this situation with you not being clear, I'd go ahead and, and put the down payment down on the home uh, and begin to get clear. Take the career clarity guide. It'll get you started. Uh, I don't know this has to be income. in the new career, but it would be really helpful to have a clue what it looks like. Yeah, so uh, that way because I that's going to tell me that. if I'm if I'm going to go, for instance, I mean, I think most extreme thing would be like I'm going to go in the real estate business. You might make zero money for six months, right? And you don't want a brand new house payment. That's right. If that if that's what you're stepping into, so mm-hmm. that would tell you. That's right. No, but so I think clarity would be very important before you make the decision because that's going to tell you if you need to spend money on education oh, yeah. or if you're going to have an income gap while you get up yeah. and running in the new gig. That's right. But once you've had that figured out, if it doesn't prohibit you, mm-hmm. uh, if it doesn't use up too much of your down payment money or give too big a gap in your income to make the jump, then you can buy the house and make the jump later once you know what it is you're going and how long it's going to take you to get there. That's the key. So I, I think I would do that. Again, you don't have to be in the new career to no, buy no. the house, but you should have a clue. This is general vagueness. That's right. Because I don't want you walking in frustrated two years or a year after you bought a house and go, I quit. You that's did exactly what? We have right. a house payment. That's exactly right. What'd you do? I'm going to kill yeah. you. Right. And, there, you know. and that's where the priority thing comes in. It becomes apparent. So again, those four questions I gave, that's after you're clear. Then you run it out and go, what's the plan to get to where I want to go? That's going to determine the money question that determines okay do i want the house now can i cash flow my qualifying process and so that's why that works together always get clear that's stage one stage two is get qualified and that's how that works michael is in atlanta hey michael welcome to the ramsey show hey how's it going better than i deserve what's up (laughs) um so i'm currently on baby step two and i'm starting a process where i do the debt snowball and really wipe out my debts um, Baby Step 2 says you should pay off all debts except for the house using the snowball. And in my case, I wanted to see if that would be the scenario. My debts are probably a little higher than average because I'm running a practice and a business. Okay, so what are you, what are you talking about? You've got a business debt that you signed personally for, yeah. so it's a personal debt. 
But how much yeah, is it? Yeah, ultimately. It's, so right now my practice debt is about $800,000. Yeah. And then my college tuition is about $185,000. Uh, college tuition. You mean student loan debt? Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, student loan debt goes in baby now. step two. $800,000 practice goes in baby step six. Okay. Yeah, so you consider that as part of like the same concept as paying off the home early then? Yeah, yeah, and, and I would call it. Um, here's a here's a kind of a correlation on that, if you will. Although the numbers aren't mm-hmm. as many zeros, but if you're if you have a home equity loan, we put it in baby step two. If it's less than half your annual income, if it's more than half your annual income, we put it in baby step six with the house. So pray tell, please tell me you have an incredible income with this delicious mess you've made. <laughs> Luckily, the first year of the business, my take home was pushing 250. So, luckily, I'm producing more than I'm spending, and I have the ability to snowball with that. Okay. So, um, you said practice. What? You're a medical doctor or a dentist? A dentist. Excellent. Okay. Yeah, the most expensive form. Okay. So, you netted <laughs> 250 last year. Correct. That's my net income. What do you think you're going to get this year? Uh, I'm aiming to up at the 300, but I'm taking a step at a time with COVID things went all over the place. So we'll okay. see. As we go. So but you're going to try to live on. You're going to try to put at least 200 a year towards this mess, right? That's at least the plan. Yeah, I'm still living on almost a college budget. So. I like that. I like that. <laughs> That's hard to do when you're making a quarter of a million yeah. dollars a year emotionally, but it is the right thing to do and the smart thing to do because you have a large mess to go with your large income. Yeah. Yeah, but that's a scary number to look at, so that's my motivation. Yeah, and I think if you – here's what I'd be looking at. How stinking wealthy you're going to become instantly when you clear the table on all this debt. I mean, you got a million dollars here in just student loans and practice debt alone. And so when you clear that million dollars off the top of your head and you're making three, three fifty, you're going to make so much money so fast, it's going to be unbelievable. But the temptation is to drag that out for a lot of people. And that's a huge mistake. We've worked with a lot of, a lot of guys and gals in the dental world over the years. And that's, uh, it, it is, you guys spend more money than MDs do uh, on your practices and on your education. It, it's, it's shocking. But the good news is you got a good practice that you stepped into, so I'm glad for you. Yeah, play through, baby. Play through. Good stuff. Wow. Yeah, got to keep the eye on the prize. I hope you folks heard what Dave said because that, that's such a huge mountain, right? But then you got to go, what's it like on the other side of that mountain? And and that's when you start piling up money and you go, okay, how long do I want to be a dentist? Well, you know, 25 years. Well, you know, you bust it over the next two, three years, you know, four years backs, really get after it. And you're on the other side of that mountain. Well, it's really fun, you know, once you get up there. And, you know, I, I think of... There's a great story of um, Sir Edmund Hillary who climbed Mount Everest the first time and he was with his climbing partner and they finally get up there and you can imagine how difficult that journey was way back then and he finally gets up at the highest point and you're looking out and that's really this idea of getting over debt and, and, and if you get so consumed with how difficult the climb is, you, many people fall off but if you're going, hey, I want to be the first person to summit that, I'm going to summit that, that's what we're about, that's the vision. When you get up there, here's what's great. On the other side of these debt-free screams that you hear on this show, people are now looking out they've been looking up during the journey but then when you finally get up there and Edmund Hillary looked at his friend his climbing Sherpa partner he said I think that's the next one we're going to climb and <laughs> isn't that amazing <laughs> on top of the world five <laughs> minutes later I think that's the one we're going to climb but now the vision is this way yeah you start and, seeing different it's a different viewpoint and that's um it is half the battle in the stuff we talk about around here from Dr. John talking about mental health to money to careers sure. to uh you know, all, all the different types of things we get ourselves into around Ramsey, uh, so much of it has to do with the view. It has to do with the perspective. And, uh, you know, they say that it's easier to make a second million. Sure, it is, because you've already done it once and you believe you can do it. It's always easier. I know I've done it twice because I was so stupid I had to do it twice. There you go. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today here on the air. This is the Ramsey Show. Allie's with us in Omaha, Nebraska. Allie, my screen says you're debt-free. Congratulations. Thank you, Dave. Thank you so much for having me on today. I am so honored to talk to you. You too. How much have you paid off? (laughs) I paid off $29,173.53. Very cool. How long did this take? Yeah, (laughs) Five months on the dot. Excellent. And your range of income during that time? (laughs) Yeah, so I was right out of school. Um, I didn't work my senior year, and so I was making, you know, like zero dollars. During when I was paying off debt, I made what would have been equivalent to about 90. And then now I'm back to about the average for a nurse, like 65, 70. So So you just dove in and took all the OT you could get? I absolutely did. I had two jobs. (laughs) Sold calligraphy signs, had all kinds of stuff on Facebook. I was busy, busy for five months. But So you graduated <laughs> past your bar and dove in? Yep, you Past got your it. boards, I guess I should say. Yeah. Okay. Yep, boards. <laughs> so so you, what kind of a nurse are you? So um, my full-time job is in the NICU. I am at a level four in Omaha, and then I do rehab hospitals on the side. PR. Wow. Good for you. Yep. So what made you so fired up to knock this out so fast? I mean, you're a ball of fire, kiddo. Yeah, thanks. Um, so I had a friend posting um, on his social media about how he had found you and how your principles are really changing his life. And I grew up with a family who, um, you know, we talked about Dave. I knew about you. I had gone to college. And honestly, for my first three years, I was debt free. I was on a full ride scholarship. But then with my nursing degree, I changed institutions from my prerequisites to my nursing school. And so my scholarship didn't transfer for my senior year. Um, And it didn't sit well with me that I was going to have to take out loans for that fourth year. So I had already kind of been game planning how I was going to pay it off fast. But then I started researching you and reading your books and listening to your podcast, honestly, obsessively um, about Christmas of the previous year. And um, yeah, the math initially really was what started the started the ball rolling. And, you know, once I started out of school, too, I started having conversations with um, my patients and patient family members, um, you know, parents in the NICU who were choosing between time with their infant in critical care and going home to their families and their other children. And just, you know, it just, it became so much more um, so quickly. Once the journey started, it was so easy to to catch fire and knock it out. So mm. Way to go. Yeah. Man, you're on fire. How Thank old are you? you. Thank you. Um, I am 23. I was 22 when I was paying off all this, my all this debt. How's it feel to be? How's it feel to be free? It's amazing, honestly. It has um, already had such an impact on my future to be able to put all of my money um, toward exciting new things. You know, I am getting married this fall, which I'm super excited about. Yay! Um, and yes, yay! And so we're like excited to have a debt-free marriage and starting off in all of those best ways. We've been able to save for retirement. You know. Um, it's just, it's light, you know, where, where a lot of, I feel like my peers are concerned about the next steps because there's always the next step, the next thing. I get to look forward to the next steps and mm. I feel really blessed. Wow. Well, because you chose a, a, a hard path that ultimately ends up being an easier path. Mm-hmm. You live like no it's one else. True. So now you can live and give like no one else. You're, you're an inspiration. So what do you tell people the secret to getting out of debt is you did it. You're a professional. Thank you. Yeah. So a big part for me was the mindset. Um, I just never let myself even think like I'm tired, you know, I'm done with this because if I did, then the deceit road just came up so quickly. So it's really keeping the mindset. Um, Accountability for me was huge. Um, I think I sent you some pictures of some post-it notes stuck on my bedroom wall. Maybe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're showing Um, up in the, uh, on the YouTube channel. That's fantastic. Yeah. Yeah, so each sticky note represented $200, and initially it was practically from the floor to the ceiling. And so I would post every two weeks, I'd make my payment onto my Instagram for all my friends and whoever to see. And it got to the point where I would like, I'm a night shift nurse, so, you know, I'd be working Thursday night into Friday morning and coming home, and people would be messaging me, where's your debt post? What have you paid today? Wow. And uh, so the accountability was massive for me for that as well. Wow. 
Well, she set up and her own budget. her own group on Instagram. Oh, oh yeah. yeah, that's amazing. So. Yeah. <laughs> well yeah. done. Well you know, done. Uh, this is a, a, a key thing here, Dave. Allie, I want to congratulate you and, and comment on this. And if I've got it wrong, that's fine. Correct me. It isn't going to bother me. But I think there's something about the right applause. When you started posting those things on Instagram and people started paying attention, they saw, oh, Allie's doing this like every week. This is showing up. And they see your progress. I'm just curious, was the encouragement from people uh, reading those posts, was that also not just accountability, but also some applause that gave you some juice? Totally. Yeah, definitely. And especially when, um, you know, I did get some messages while I was paying off all my debt of friends saying, you know, I don't know where to start. I don't know how to do this. And so, you know, I, I was able to call them and talk through starting of a budget or a game plan they might be able to attack. I've been passing out your total money makeover books, Dave, like crazy. Um, it's been really awesome to watch everyone else get on fire with me because it's become kind of this group shared vision. Um, and yeah, I mean, honestly, the encouragement that I got each week was so awesome. I had friends who are older than me and have gone through your program before sending me money for coffee on my way to my sixth shift, you know, and they were just being so supportive, you know, like they see how hard I was working and um, they were so, so encouraging, so supportive. You're an amazing young woman. I'm, I'm so proud you. of you. Very, yeah. very, very well done. Well, uh, we're going to send you a you. copy of Rachel Cruz's latest book, Know Yourself, Know Your Money. Uh, Ken, I'm pretty convinced if we could get about 50,000 alleys going, we could change this whole nation. That's about all it would take. We could, I think we could, you... tip, we could tip over all the idiots out there no pretty quick. If we had 50,000 alleys, it'd be it. done. Yep. It'd change the whole world. Way to go. I'm mm. so happy for you. You're so you're so bright, so yes. so loud, so, uh, so, so, you know, just so much coming out of you. It's pretty amazing. Very, very cool. Thank all you. All right. Alley Thank in so Omaha, much. Nebraska, $29,000 paid off in five. Five months making 90 to 65 all the ot and nurse can stand count it down let's hear a debt-free scream all right three two one i'm debt-free yeah wow pretty amazing i don't want to have a baby in nicu Mm-mm. But if I did and she walked around the corner, things would be a little better. Well said. Wow. Talk about infectious. Man. <laughs> we, that's I'm a, smiling just yes. because she's smiling and you yes. can hear her smile. No question. She's fired up, man. And, and you know, there is something between that and, and it's amazing over the years of doing this. This is how we ended up coining the phrase personal finance is 80% behavior. It's 20% head knowledge. Your behavior flows from your beliefs. That's right. You, you would never act on something you don't believe to be true unless you're a psychopath. So otherwise, you you know, farmers would never plant seed if they didn't expect a crop. Uh, and so there's a belief that causes that behavior, that action of planting. And in, in her case, she believes. And it's amazing to me. I, I, I talk to people making $120,000 a year, and they can't figure out how to pay off $20,000 because Eeyore is their spirit animal. And then I talk to people like her. She's straight out of college. She has zero money and passes her boards, goes, gets six jobs all in nursing at one time. I'm I'm exaggerating, but I mean, she went crazy because she just was on fire. I mean, she was just burning at both ends and and knocks this thing out in 29 months. Dave, you said something that's so huge. Uh, Folks, don't miss what he said. Belief. Belief in what you're doing, belief that you can do it, but also the belief of others. I just had the thought, I was sitting there listening to her story, in today's world more than ever, because of social media and 24-hour news and the woke mob and all the things, we are so worried about criticism, what other people say. And we ought to be, we ought to not be worried about criticism. We ought to be looking for the right applause from people who go, yeah, you can lose that weight. Yes, you can pay that debt off. Yes, you can get that training. Yes, you can get that job. You can do that. We need applause. That extra bit of belief from people who know why we're doing it and believe that we can do it is a game changer. Man, if we could offset some applause for all the trolls. Yeah, stop worrying about the critics. It's amazing. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. He is host of The Ken Coleman Show, heard on 75-plus radio stations, plus a podcast and a ever-popular show on Sirius XM. It's all about careers and jobs and finding your purpose. So jump in and join The Ken Coleman Show, and you can join Ken today right here. The phone number, 888-825-5225. Brent's with us in Boise, Idaho. Hey, Brent, what's up? Hey, y'all. Thanks for taking my call. Sure. How can we um, help? Question is for Ken. Um, so I just started um, a new job a month or two ago, um, and I accepted um, my salary, and I was happy enough with it. Um, and then I found out that my coworkers are making about 50% more than I do, like 45%. What do you make? Um, and I was wondering, uh, I'm making 22 an hour. Doing what? Uh, medical lab scientist. And they're making 33 an hour. Uh, yeah, 32. Are they measurably more experienced than you? Uh, no. How did you come they about this? We're infor- all dealing. How'd you get this information? I'm from them. <laughs> There's two of us that work on this, particular, two others and then me that were working on this one. We're dealing with COVID. Well, I gotta lean. I, I, I gotta tell you, I, I gotta lean a little bit on Dave. I got some thoughts, but Dave is no, hired and fired a lot. No, no, but you've got a unique perspective in how many people you've hired and fired in culture development. But I, so, so this is really challenging. Okay, because this is all psychology, and you're human, and so you've got to. You're going to have to rise above this. Is the straightforward answer? Uh, because if you don't. This is going to eat you alive, and I don't think you'll last very long. Uh, this is the, the natural comparison, uh, and comparison is a cancer. The only person I try to compare myself to is the me of yesterday, and, and that's hard, but that's what you got to do. Um, because if, if, if you're saying things are equal, and it's an equal playing field, they don't have any more experience than you, they don't have any additional uh, uh, rec- uh, excuse me, certifications or all that stuff, uh, this is a really nasty situation to find out about. I got to tell you, I'm slight bit cynical, maybe suspect that you got the information from them. I'm not saying they lied to you, but the whole thing just stinks. And if you want to be there, here's the last piece. If you want to be there in the sense that it's the ladder you need to be on for your career and where you eventually want to get to, and you got to be on this rung to get to the next rung, then you're going to have to really suck it up and, and be the better man here and, and stay out of this kind of stuff and, and earn the next rung. If you can't handle that, then you're eventually probably going to self-select and, and have to get out of there. And I'm sorry that that's happened to you because it's a real devastating psychological blow. It's a really good question you brought to the forefront here. And the interesting thing about it is your tone – when you're asking the question is not whiny you're just like it's it's like a curiosity to mm-hmm. you which is a positive thing so there's not a you're not angry or bitter or something like that you're just like this doesn't make sense it's like a scientist right i mean it's, I, there's a riddle here and so um i'm gonna join you in the riddle why would you if you were to guess why the discrepancy in pay what would you guess um because they are, I mean, it's a business or hospital, and they're just trying to get as little um, or pay as little. I came from a. So you don't think it's an hospital. oversight? Um, you, you know, you don't think they saw something different in your qualifications than the other guy? You, you don't think there's a logical explanation other than just sheer they didn't want to pay as much and they thought they could get away with it, and they did. And they did. I couldn't come in. I thought the job was a technician job, not a technologist job. Um, and so when they gave me my pay, I was like, well, this is really exciting. Yes, I'll take this because it was like four bucks more than I thought it was going to be. Um, and then I found out what the job really entailed. I, I am a biochemist, not a medical lab scientist. I see. Um, yeah, I've been learning to play golf, and I figured out the secret to happiness is low expectations. <laughs> um <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, you had low expectations, and then you got a $4 more, and you thought, this is wonderful, and then you found out you're $10 under, and it's all about expectations. What Ken said, it's a psychological problem. So what is the environment so like? Uh, what's the environment like between you and your supervisor or your hiring, the person that did the hiring with you? 
is this a an open conversational um, good people or is it very chain of command real shut your mouth get your work done i mean what is it authoritative or i it, that is a great question um the only time i've met my supervisor is the day i was interviewed she went on leave right after that and then has since come back from leave and has never stepped in and i'm a night shift and so i haven't uh, she's gone before i come in yeah well i um what i have figured out is is that there there is going to be a difficult conversation Mm -hmm. it is going to be in your head and your head's going to explode or eventually, or you're going to have a difficult conversation. And the, the trick is how to sit down with her and have a difficult conversation. And what uh, one of the things we teach leaders to do, and uh, you're leading up in this situation, is to just, if, if, if there's an elephant in the room, go, hey, there's an elephant over there. Don't act like he's not there. And so let's just call out a couple of things that we know here, Okay. Number one, when I interviewed for this job, I first thought it was this, and then I found out it was that, and I was $4 more than I thought, and so I was really happy, and I'm grateful. And by the way, I am grateful for the job. And I haven't got, gotten to talk to you a lot because you've been out on leave, and of course I'm night shift, but I'm swinging by this afternoon to have a five-minute meeting with you, Just uh, and I want you to hear nothing but gratitude from me. Um, but uh, I got to talking to the other guys in the lab, and I found out that I'm the only guy with the exact same qualifications that makes 22, and they all make 32. And what I want to ask you is, what can I do to make myself worth 32 to you guys? Because I'd like to measure up, and apparently I've not done that yet. And that pretty well uh, exposes the crap without you going, you people rip me off. <laughs> you know, that's the other way to approach it, in which case you just get fired. Brent, really quick, I want to jump in and ask this question. Are you able to do the market research and be able to show that there's a range of income and that the work you're actually doing uh, does pay higher? Can you, is that is that something you can find the evidence for and show that in the marketplace? Um, there is. They are actually above average what the other two are making. Yeah. Well, what um, I would do is just, I would just say all that. of this. Yeah. And I just would, say, number one, I'm happy at 22. I'm not coming in here to gripe about them making more. And number two, I know that the pay of brown here is above average in general. But what I'm trying to do is figure out how I can be more valuable to this place so that I can be worth it. And you put me in for a 32 instead of a 22. But I, I want to earn it, and I want you to tell me how I can be the best person I need to be to do that. And I don't want you to hear anything from me but gratitude. Listen, if if your boss gets twisted up about that, your boss is an idiot. Yeah, there's your sign. That's not a long-term stay. Yeah. The and, one and thing if I'm they con- go, shut up and get in your corner, you accepted the job, <laughs> right. then uh, then start looking for another position. But but I don't think they will. I, um, I think you're bringing it up. And what you're doing is you're exposing the fact that all of these facts are here. Oh, by the way, you can also say, I accepted the job at 22. So I did this deal. Mm-hmm. And I'm so I can't come in and gripe about the deal. I'm not here to gripe about the deal. I took the job. And, uh, and so, you know, the fact that somebody else makes more does not make me unhappy. But what I do want to do is I want to figure out a track that I can get on to be of value to this place to where I can join them in that kind of an income uh, because that would make me feel really fulfilled and I would know that I did a good job for you guys. Yeah. And that kind of just keep talking about it that way. But, you know, A, I took the job. I, I, I did the deal. So I got no gripes because if you'd have been 32, if it had been 42, if it had been you know, whatever number you'd have taken the job. And so you took the job, you know, and just admit that. Admit that you're, you're grateful and that we don't have a relationship because I've not seen you. And just put all these things that are facts out on the table so that, that, that there's nothing swirling around as a side uh, communication that's not happening. And be real careful with your body language, your tone, and your pacing. And be real calm like you've been with us and not whiny. Keep your octave down no high octaves. This is The Ramsey Show.
Have a friend or family member that needs a daily dose of Ramsey advice in their life? Let them know about the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast. It's a quick hit of advice about life and money in under 10 minutes. Check out the Ramsey Call of the Day podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, host of The Ken Coleman Show, where they talk about careers and jobs and finding your purpose. He's my co-host today. So you can ask questions about life, money, careers. We're here to help you. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888-825-5225. Alex is going to start off the hour in San Diego. Hi, Alex. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hey, guys. Thanks for having me on. Sure. What's up? So um, I actually talked to you and Karen a little under a year ago. I think it was in July of last year. And me and my wife, we were considering buying a house, uh, but considering moving soon. And what I didn't really mention at that time is that we plan to move uh, for the purpose of serving in the ministry overseas in Europe. We're in our mid-20s, and we thought this was a ways off at the time because we wanted to have around $200,000 in the bank before leaving just to safety net because we didn't know how it worked financially. But my business has really taken off in the past year or so, and we've been able to save up a lot more. So we really want to use this as a blessing um, to get that ministry started started sooner. We'll be providing for ourselves. Uh, the church will not be helping us, which we're okay with, um, but we will be taking a pretty big pay cut. So that should allow us to take care of our expenses and retirement, but not much else. My question is just kind of a rocking chair, Uncle Dave type of question. You know, can you give me any financial advice I should be thinking about and just kind of talk me through, you know, having mental peace with taking a pay cut, providing for myself and my wife, Um, because it just kind of freaks me out cutting our our salary kind of in, uh, or I guess our income, you know, by by more than two thirds. Yeah. Do you own a business? Yeah, I do. What are you going to do with it? Uh, I'm going to keep it going. I have some employees um, that I've been training, and they're going to help me take over a good portion of my workload. So I'll, I'll be working maybe 10 to 20 hours a week instead of, you know, 40 to 50. And Why just, would you pay yourself less then? Just remotely, right? Yeah, it's going to be remotely. Are you um, expecting not, the income from the business to go down? No, I don't think so. Um, but, the, you know, I'm hoping by the time that we leave, the people that I have working for me kind of part-time, they're ready to step into a full-time. Oh, so your expenses are going to go up. Your net profit is going to go down. Exactly, yeah. That's what, okay, now I understand. All right, because you're hiring yeah, people and, to know, do what you used to do. might come down a little bit. I don't know, but, yeah. you know, I... I, I don't know how, how long do you think you're going to be in the in. on the mission field? Uh, we're looking at a minimum of, of two to three years, mm-hmm. but we'll reassess it with you know at that point. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, that gives me a lot of peace. You ask about peace. Um, I mean, obviously, if God's hand is on this and God called you to this, that gives you a level of peace. Um, but it doesn't mean that missionaries don't face that are called don't face uh, financial struggles. Most of them do, as a matter of fact. Uh, it's a hard, it's a hard life you're signing up for. It's a tough thing. Um, and yet it's one of the most rewarding things probably you can do on the planet if you're called to it. So, uh, and you obviously are, I'm not questioning that the sec, but, but from a, uh, uh, less of a spiritual lens, but more of an emotional or psychological lens, if you can see the end of something, you can walk through anything with peace. Um, if you can say it's going to be over here, it's the perpetual thing that drives people nuts, the ambivalence. And so even if it's pain, you can say, okay, this pain is, you know, doc says, I'm, I'm, you know, this is, I'm, I'm going to, uh, start this procedure and it's going to really hurt for 30 seconds. But obviously five years from now, you're going to be well because of this 30 seconds of pain. You can endure the 30 seconds of pain, but if he just starts cutting on you, you don't know how long it's going to be. I mean, that pain eats you alive psychologically. So if you can see the end of it, and so I would set a time. I would say, we're going to commit to 
two years, three years, whatever the mark is. And at that time, we're committing to moving back home and ending this mission. Now, we will stay, keep ourselves open to the fact that God asks us to stay and we feel called to stay and so on. But for right now, our, our level of commitment is a three-year commitment. At the end of that, we're coming back home. See, if you set that, that gives you a sense of uh, uh, destiny, a sense of an end to this, a light at the end of the tunnel that's not an oncoming train, financially or mathematically. A- and then you can scra- mm-hmm. scrape and claw and scratch and sacrifice for that period of time. Uh, but, but eventually you got to come up for air. You can't hold your breath, but for so long. So the, it's the ambivalence that drives people nuts. The lack of clarity. Ken? Alex, I thought I heard you say that the company made more money. So you're moving the timeline up to go to the mission field. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. We have a good, we have a really good safety net of just kind of our fixed amount in the bank, but. And know, I understand that, but let me you ask you this. Money coming in month over month and it kind of freaks you out. Not I, I money, totally understand. But here's my question for you. Do you feel God's pressed a call to, to move the timeline up or do you, are you just reacting to this timeline based on, well, when I, we said we were going to move on and move when we hit this goal financially, I'm just wondering what's driving the increased timeline because we hit the number we planned or do you feel a press to go? And I've got a follow-up yeah. question. So is it yes or no on that? Yeah, no, I, I mean, I feel, uh, I felt a, a big pressure and weight of helping in this ministry for a long time. Okay. But honestly, the goals that we set financially were not necessary. It just kind of felt like a secular safety net. Uh-huh. But even that made me feel bad. And now being way beyond that, I just feel even more of a burden of it because it feels okay. like, I, you know, I have to go do this. All right. So I think you got to listen to that. Uh, and I think you, I think you got to honor right. that. And I think yeah. what Dave said is, is right. But the only thing I would tell you is, is that I, I would not assume that just because you're taking on the increased cost of employees, because that's real that the company wouldn't grow and I would do everything I could to see if we can keep those revenues going and really dive in and then just and then and then I think God's going to bless you regardless. Uh but I just wouldn't assume that all of a sudden um the company won't grow. Uh, I'd try to train those folks and and stay in tune in those 10 hours or whatever you're doing and try to lead them and see if if God doesn't bless that and grow that and business. You might schedule, you know, maybe a little bit of extra you got to schedule a, a, an occasional 2 week move back here mm-hmm. to sit, sit around and, and do things for two weeks in the company and then go back and give it a little booster Great shot. Great point. Missionaries you do know. that all the time. Yeah, come do back. Little, do, you know, they come back to raise funds. You're going to come back to run the businesses that's supporting Since you. Since you're self-funding. Yeah. And keep, you know, that you're self-funding. That's a from. great so point. You don't have to stay there the entire time and work remotely uh, 10, 10 hours a week. Uh, and so you, you can run back and forth a little bit. It's not that hard. And, um, uh, but yeah, I think if you see things less permanent and more flexible, it keeps you from losing your peace to answer your question. And so I would add the flexibility of some returns and, uh, I would put a deadline on it that, um, you know, that unless, you know, my wife and I both hear from God, then we're coming home after three years. And so, uh, or whatever, and you can pray and determine that deadline in prayer. I don't care, but it, I, I think leaving the door open and we're going to just stay until dot, 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 that'll drive you bananas. Unless you're planning to be a full-time right. missionary the rest of your life, yeah. which you did not tell me that. You told he me did. otherwise. Which means he could also, they could both come back, keep that business viable and growing, and continue to go back over time, take their kids back. Yeah. It becomes a generational yeah. thing. It's a both end. It doesn't have it to always be all in. It doesn't have to be a uh, you know, one-year mission trip, right. and then you're done forever. And it doesn't have to be a you're on the field forever, and you never come back to the States. Um, so it, we just have better transportation and technology these days. So it's a cool thing you're doing, brother. Thanks for letting us participate. Hey, folks, I got a great option to help you pay for your education. The Army National Guard. The Army National Guard believes you are the next greatest generation because you have proven that even in adversity, that you have what it takes to succeed. That's why they offer benefits like tuition assistance, career training, and a paycheck to help you avoid debt. No matter what your goals are, the Army National Guard can help you get there. Visit NationalGuard.com to find out more. Ken 
Ben Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today. Have you ever asked questions like, how much should I be saving? How much debt should I be paying off and how can I do it faster? Or what's the right way to invest? The good news is you don't have to figure out the answers on your own. Ramsey Plus, which includes Financial Peace University, will guide you every step of the way. With a Ramsey Plus membership, you get all the digital teaching you need to really understand money so you can be confident that you're always doing the next right thing. See, not knowing what to do is the biggest problem. Knowing what to do and then having the motivation to do it is the easy part. We can show you that. Our world-class budgeting app, every dollar. Our tools, our guided action steps to help you make progress on your money fast. It means no more debt. It means cash in the bank when there's an emergency and a real plan for your future. Ramsey Plus helps you get small, consistent wins every day that lead to big results and lifelong habits. To get started with a free trial, text TRIAL to 33789. That's TRIAL to 33789. Ryan is with us in Starkville, Mississippi. Hi, Ryan. How are you? Good. How are you, Dave? Better than I deserve. What's up? So me and my fiance are both 22 years old, graduating college, both from Mississippi State at the end of the month. Wonderful. What are your degrees in? I'm in construction management, and she is elementary ed. Excellent. Uh, When are you getting married? Both uh, November or September 10th. Good for you. Glad you got. I'm glad, I'm uh, glad you got it straight. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. September uh, York, 10th, big day, man. Congratulations. I appreciate it. All right. My question is: so neither of us will have debt. Uh, my parents helped me pay my way through college, uh, and she had a full ride scholarship through excellent student teaching program. So she just has to teach in Mississippi for five years after graduation. Um, We'll have just under $100,000 of joint income once we're married. Um, and I will both be living with family, so very low expenses till then. So plan on saving as much as we can until we're married. Our question is, do we need to look at renting as our first housing option, or should we look at buying since we're both debt-free and have that leg up on some? Well, you financially meet the guidelines that we give you for buying. We tell you to be debt-free, have an emergency fund of three to six months of expenses before you buy, and then buy a 15-year mortgage with a payment no more than a fourth of your take-home pay on a fixed-rate 15-year mortgage. That's the guidelines that we use. Now, I will tell you as a a dad of 20-somethings and 30-somethings and as having coached folks for 30 years, I personally think you will make a much better housing decision if you wait one year. And so I would be per, I would be looking for homes uh, this time next year into the summer with the idea of closing in September, one year on your one year anniversary, give or take. It takes about a year of living together as a married couple to know how close to your mother-in-law to buy (laughs) you have to get you have to get to know each other to make a better decision right now there's a lot of wonderful milestones happening in your life you you know you would not be human if you didn't have stars in your eyes uh you know you're you're getting married you're graduating you both got good careers you're debt free man what a wonderful start you've got yes everything's great here it's not going to kill you if you buy a house but i think you'll buy a different house one year from marriage than you would have today. And if you start your real estate career at 23, 24 years old, instead of 22 years old, that is not the end of the world. You are still going to be wealthy. You're still going to be fine. You haven't thrown the money away. You've just concentrated on your marriage. Spend the first year concentrating on your marriage. A hundred percent. Don't, there's an old thing in the old Testament in the Bible that they, they would not allow a soldier to go to war in the first year of marriage and the first year of marriage they had to stay home and get the home solid before they went off to war of course they were often gone for years at a time when they went off to war but so it's a little different but but it's a it's a principle coming out of uh, second kings yeah ryan here's a little secret that when you become a homeowner you start owning problems that happen with that home and i think that 
Dave has nailed this. I think that in addition to what he said is to have a year of just renting a nice apartment, you guys can afford it and enjoy just living together and learning what kind of a home do we want. And as Dave has said uh, so beautifully there, that that is going to become more clear uh, a year later. But, you know, you don't need the additional stress that comes with marriage uh, dealing with new being jobs, a homeowners. new yeah. jobs, new marriage. We're sharing silverware and mustard. Yeah, come home, I mean, it's hang just, out at the pool at the apartment complex, be young and married with no kids, and chill. And just not have to think about, all, yeah. you know, the gutters. The gutter I doesn't work. I agree with that. The heat and air is not working. That's what nobody tells you. You got to put up curtain rods, which <laughs> that that by the way is the third largest cause of divorce. Yes, hanging it's curtains. True, but um, that's you know. true. <laughs> because here's why: in 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 Stacy's house, her dad did it. This is a true story. My wife, we've been married almost 23 years. In my house... And he knew how to do, run a screwdriver. He knew how to do it well. Something that... Something I don't something know how Mr. to Coleman do. Something Mr. Coleman might not know how to do. I have no talent in that area. But you do, you learn those things. What time do we eat dinner? They used to eat dinner at this time in my house. Who does what? My dad used to fill the dishwasher, you know? Who knows? You got all these cultures, You roll these the toothpaste things. or squeeze it. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of major Good philosophical call. things that have to be uh, Are you and Sharon in alignment on how to handle the tube of toothpaste? This is what people want to know. Yeah. Uh, you are? Yeah, we each have our own in separate <laughs> ends of that massive ba- master bedroom right, bathroom. That's so. the right answer. That's yeah. where we had to go. And that way she doesn't get in my way. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, you know that's how it went down <laughs> yeah i didn't want to agree with that no you better not no uh you me stacy will all be in trouble uh so yeah you're that but i mean it's it it's a there is nothing wrong with and you're gonna you ryan you're gonna get tremendous pressure from all these financial geniuses that aren't mm-hmm. you know you're just throwing your money away you need so to go buy 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 and it's okay yeah i'm not suggesting you go a decade with that home ownership i'm talking about 12 freaking months and let this thing have a little breathe, a little rhythm to it. Mm-hmm. And that's just an opinion, and it's probably worth what you paid for it, but I feel pretty strongly about that. I tell young couples that are getting married, wait at least a year to buy a home. You got enough other things you got to adjust in your life to get square on. Good stuff. Good question. Sarah is with us. Sarah's in Dayton, Ohio. Hi, Sarah. How are you? Doing well. My question is... Um I want to know if I'm taking out enough money, investing enough, so that when I retire, I can have money to blow. Okay. How much are you investing? Okay. So my husband, my husband takes out. Um, it's about six hundred and twenty-five dollars a month into deferred comp, and I take three hundred dollars out of a month of our paychecks into our deferred comp. Mm-hmm. How old are you? Um, I'm thirty-seven. He's thirty-six. He has. About a hundred and twenty thousand in his, and I only have about fifteen thousand mm-hmm. in mine. Mm-hmm. And every year, we plan on adding an extra twenty five dollars to it. Well, it just depends on how much you plan to blow. But you're gonna, you should, you should have millions of dollars with what you're outlining. Okay, just because I want to be able to, you know, just up and leave and go wherever I want, or you know. Well, Take a friend with us to that Hawaii. Depends on, that depends on wherever you want. I mean, are you up and leaving and jumping on your own 747 jet? Uh, the, the context that, that matters. A, that cost $100 million, and you're going to live in <laughs> on the beach and uh, 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 you know, buy some of the most expensive real estate in the world? No, you're not going to have that much money. But you're going to have millions. Like you're you're going to have millions. Yeah. If you want to go to if Cancun I'm- and stay in an all-inclusive with a couple friends, you'll be able to afford it. Oh. Okay, now that I can handle, I just, if we just keep adding $25 extra every year to it. Yeah, but here's the thing. Here's the thing. You need to probably reset some of this stuff, and uh, I'll send you a copy of the Total Money Makeover. You need to be doing, uh, uh, deferred comp is the last one you would do. The first one you would do is anything like a 401k with a match, and anything that's Roth is second. And traditional investments in 401ks and IRAs are third. Deferred comp would be fourth. And you probably have other options available that will serve you better in these goals. And, of course, we're going to get you out of debt before you do any of that. So hang on. I'll send you a copy of the book, The Total Money Makeover, which will walk you through exactly what to do and exactly when to do it. Hold on.
Ken Coleman Ramsey, personality, is my co-host today. Ken, our favorite thing to do on the show is a debt-free scream. Our next favorite thing that's a little bit better is to do a debt-free scream live in the lobby. But the best of all debt-free screams are our own Ramsey team members doing their debt-free screams on the debt-free stage right here in the lobby with half the freaking company not working, <laughs> standing out here watching. Yes. That's awesome. So the only very time cool. you're happy when they're not working. We the, need to Well, that's true. We need to celebrate. Yes. We need to celebrate. That's right. But then we're going to get right back to work. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> so Jim Nally is with us. He's been with us about four years and is a, a director of paid media. A digital marketing team is uh, here with, your, with his wife. And your wife's name... It's Amanda. Amanda. Yeah. Well, welcome, guys. Congratulations. You did it. You did, did it. it. <laughs> how much did you pay off and how long did it take? We paid off $217,000 over Lord. five years. Whoa. Five years. That's yeah. amazing. And you've been here four years. Yes. <laughs> so you've been in the middle of serious positive peer pressure for a long period <laughs> yes. of time as a part of this. Yeah. I mean, what better environment to make you do this stuff? And uh, so I'm so proud of you guys. That's a long slog. Tell us yeah. the story. What happened five years ago that started the process? And in the middle of or in the, early in the process, you end up here. Yeah. Yeah. So we um, originally took FPU right at eight years ago. And it was in the middle of a season of just hard, hard times. We had uh, just had a baby who was born 10 weeks early. We were barely making any money. And we had started floating some bills between some credit cards and had a massive amount of student loan debt. Mm. So of the 217, about 150 or 160 was student loan debt. Wow. What was the rest of it? About 40 was medical and then kind of a smattering of small consumer things on top of that. So a mountain of debt, no income to amount to anything. Baby comes early. Yep. It's like the perfect storm. Yeah. So we took And then you go at FPU, which says, it's going to be okay. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And we believed it. And we started to to work it, but in very, like, baby, baby steps. Not even actually working the baby steps yet. Crawling. Yep. Yep. So very kind of Dave-ish. We were still floating between the credit cards, but we were trying to stick to a budget. And then when when it wouldn't work, we'd get frustrated, and we'd jump way back to that spot of not wanting to open the bank account again, being terrified of what what was lurking kind of anytime we'd pull that screen up and uh, a few years later, well, why don't you tell that part of it? <laughs> yeah. So about five years ago is when we really kicked into gear. Um, it was about Christmas time. And I remember we were trying to get presents together and we had two small kids at that point and we were scraping the other pennies for a loaf of bread to yeah. eat dinner. I mean, yeah. it was yeah. that bad. Yeah. Um, and I remember walking through the grocery store and there were these carolers singing through the grocery store and I'm just crying. Yeah. Like, why are you oh so bad come happy? Why are you so yeah. happy? Yeah. <laughs> and, um, and I was just like, I went home and I'm like, I can't, we can't do this anymore. I, yeah. I, we cannot do this anymore. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. Amen. And um, so we started working it. Yeah, we busted out our copy of Total Money Makeover, pulled out every dollar, started just getting back on it again. Mm-hmm basically reset on our snowball because it had been in a couple spreadsheets and then we're like nope let's fresh start from today let's get it figured out and then it's just been hustling ever since yeah and how'd you end up here yeah so um we have been in the nashville area about 10 years i used to work down the street from the old office and uh walt yates one of our uh vps now Mm -hmm. reached out to me uh and said, hey, you want to come chat, have coffee? And then uh, in kind of a miracle of hiring here, 10 days later, had an offer and was starting starting my new role. And since then, the team has grown from just me to a team of 10. And we're looking for a lot more digital marketers out here, too. But Absolutely. It's been a, been a wild ride for the last four years. Yeah, that is a miracle. Of <laughs> yeah. you standing out here that got hired, how many of you took longer than 10 days? Raise yeah. your hand. Everybody? All yeah. of them. Yeah, that go. never <laughs> happens. Yeah. It's like harder to get on with the FBI than it is us. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we're, we're pretty choosy because we don't want crazy in the building. Yep. So <laughs> yep. way to go, man. So cool. And you've obviously, your, your career here, I've followed you. I know who you are and what you're doing. And you've done a great job here and uh, have continued to advance in this place. And yep. um, and, and I'm, we're not going to ask your incomes during this time because your coworkers are standing around. That's not what <laughs> I do. But, but, um, but you guys have done an incredible, incredible job. Five years. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. How's it feel? It honestly hasn't even quite hit us no. yet. It's this like, I'll have moments of just being busy and then things get quiet for a moment. And then I'm like, whoa, like everything's changed. Yeah. There's this 
just kind of sense of awe and yeah. a real sense of like God was reminding me this week, I've brought you this far. Wait until you see what I do next. Yeah, mm-hmm. just wait. Like that That's kinda, good. Yeah. Yeah. The next chapter is going to be awesome. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah, yeah Amanda, that was, uh, you need to write that story of the grocery store out to be able to hand it to your daughter on, uh, you know, three weeks after she gets married. <laughs> so she, she can know where, how her family tree was changed. Yeah. Cause that was Sharon. Sharon used to say, she, people say, you know, how much money you want? She said, I just want to be able to go to the grocery store and buy a full buggy. Mm. That's all I want. Mm-hmm. And, Truthfully, that, that has satisfied her for a very long time. <laughs> you know, it's just, she really didn't change that. I mean, she, there's, we bought lots of other things, but, it, you know, that, there, that was kind of like a measure that we weren't desperate and freaked out anymore. Yeah. Yeah. If we could just go to the grocery store and buy a whole buggy of groceries. I mean, yeah. with babies running around and all that. So such a great, great job, you guys. Very, very well done. Who were your biggest cheerleaders? Um, our our parents, my parents, are here today with us. Yay! Uh, that's awesome. Cheering us along the way. Jim's parents too. Yeah. They just weren't able to make the trip. But yeah. um, also Lots our of, church yeah. family. You know, we had a small group of people that mm-hmm. knew. What, ch- ex- what church are you in? Uh, we've been going to. Um, well, <laughs> it's complicated. <laughs> okay, uh, just, yeah. just leave. Just move changed. on. Yeah. Just move on. That's <laughs> yeah, all right. Yeah. I thought it, <laughs> there's several great we, churches in the area. There's a lot of great churches. Just leave it alone. We're good. Yeah. We okay, love so your cheerleaders were your mom and dad. Of course, yeah. you, had, yes. you had a couple of cheerleaders on the team, I'm sure. Folks yeah. on the team yeah. knew what you were yes, doing. absolutely. They, they, yep. We all talk about this stuff yep. all the time. We really actually do the things we teach we do. around here. It's walk pretty amazing. Yeah. yeah, Pretty crazy. Yeah, Our whole theme for the internal team this year is to walk the talk. we got T-shirts everywhere, teaching Financial Peace University, the team again this year, and, and just getting everybody involved and everybody winning. And I'd uh, be ashamed to work here and not, not do this stuff, yeah. you know? So proud of you guys. I got to ask you, when you do something for a year, two years, yeah. and that's intense commitment. Five years yeah. is next level. And, and I heard you say, you know, I'm still recalling that, hey, we're actually debt free. Yeah. I want you to talk to people who are feeling like they're in the middle of that run. They're in that. They're going. They're stuck. We, we, we like feel like we're halfway hard. through and it's really, really hard. And, yeah. and it feels like even though we know we've made progress, it doesn't feel feel and seem like we're ever going to get there. What do you say to those folks? Yeah. The biggest thing, even as we were just reflecting the last few days, um, when you hit a wall, when you uh, have a month where you don't quite hit your budget, when you have something that comes up unexpectedly, sets you back, when you're on a journey that long, the biggest thing is just to to keep making progress. Mm -hmm. Like, look at progress, not perfection. I can't tell you how many times we hit the line. That's a great phrase. Yeah, it is. (laughs) I can't tell you how many times we hit the like, oh, we missed it this month. And then our first instinct is to shut down and not want to look at it again, not want to pick it back up. But being able to just pick it back up time after time. And sometimes there's longer gaps on those times and sometimes it's shorter. Uh, The other thing I'd say is don't put off, especially if it's going to be this long, don't put off the things to take care of your mental and spiritual Mm -hmm. and relational health. Like we've both um, been to see some counselors and Mm -hmm. that sort of thing along Mm -hmm. the way. And it was critical to take care of our, our souls and our family. That's good. Absolutely. While we're taking care of our finances. That's very wise. And you brought the, uh, brought the kiddos to do the debt free screen with you. Their names and ages. We We have Sarah. She is about to turn nine. She's our little preemie. All right. Here healthy today. And this is Judah. He's six. All right. Very (laughs) cool. And I'm sure they've been practicing their debt free screen. Oh, yes. All right. It's Sarah and Judah, Amanda and Jim. He's a director of paid media here, digital marketing team, looking for some more team members just like him. And a pretty incredible story, Jim. We're so proud of you guys. $217,000 paid off in five years. Count it down. Let's hear a debt free scream. Three, Three, two, two, one. We're We're debt debt free. is how it's done, ladies and gentlemen. How fun is that? Man, they cleared up a bunch of debt. That was a lot. This is The Ramsey Show.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host. You jump in. We'll talk about your life and your money. It's a free call at 888-825-5225. Calvin's in Los Angeles. Hi, Calvin. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Hi, Dave. Huge respect for what you guys do. Thank um, you, sir. I've got a quick question. Okay. I'm uh, 22 years old, recently graduated from college, and I'm just starting my career. Uh, I currently live at home, but I've been saving everything I make, and I have a good amount saved up right now. And I want to purchase a house, but living in Los Angeles, housing prices are just astronomical, and I just don't see myself being able to afford one anytime soon. So I was wondering if you have any advice on if I should just get out of L.A. or any way I could possibly become a homeowner anytime within the next few years. Hmm. Well, it's, a, a you know, obviously you've analyzed the situation correctly. It's an expensive market, and in order to buy a home there, you're going to have to have a pretty substantial income. What do you do? I'm a manager currently at a warehouse. I make about 70000 a year. Your phone's cutting in and out. You make about what a year? I make about 70000 a year. As a manager at a warehouse. Okay. What's the career path? You mentioned possibly moving for your career. What's it look like moving up the ladder 10, 15, 20 years down the line? Well, the company I'm working at is expanding pretty rapidly, so there is definitely a um, good opportunity where I'm at. Um, I'm enjoying the work. So I could see myself, and I do believe in the next few years um, my income will increase. And they have a lot of opportunities out of state, so I'd be open to moving. I'm just a little nervous about I've lived in L.A. my whole life new. Yeah, well, that would be human. Um, most people would be nervous about doing something new. It's also an adventure. Um, it can be it can be mm-hmm. exciting and scary simultaneously. Mm-hmm. Um, and um, here's the thing: you don't you do not have to look at a move as a permanent equation. You're 22, 23 years old, so you could take a job making seventy thousand with the exact same company in another city where real estate prices are half what they are there and start your life. There's nothing to say that five years later, you don't take a job in LA and move back. You know, there's nothing to say you don't end up in whatever city, you know, after that. But there's, um, uh, I, I would challenge you to say, you know, some people when they're 22 and they graduate from college, they go back backpacking in Europe for a year for an adventure and don't do anything except see Europe, which is kind of cool, a little hippie ish, but kind of cool. But uh, instead, you could just say, my adventure is going to be another city for four years. Yep. I love that. I'm going to pile on to what Dave's saying. This is a great idea. I would take the top three cities. You said there were some opportunities for you to make money. What are those potential promotions? What cities do those exist in? And then let's say there's three cities, four cities, five cities. Uh, you're a single guy. You've got some vacation time. Go visit. I'd go visit the cities. Yeah, that's good. It's not so scary <laughs> when we actually go see it. And uh, hang out a little bit. And to Dave's point, now we go, wait, I can move this city, move up. I'm what, making more money. Yeah, what area of town do the 22-year-old, 23-year-olds live in? And, you know, which is really the cool end of town typically, right? But, I mean, there's some really neat cities in America. Uh, and you can enjoy some – you'd enjoy th- three or four weeks of good travel uh, or three or four weekends, long weekends of good travel or something, and see some of these areas and then see what your company can open up for you. You're not in a hurry, but you're not nailed down. You, you're more free and mobile today than probably you ever will be again in your life. That makes a lot of sense. I'll tell you this too, Calvin. You may not believe how free it is in some other cities. Guys in Los Angeles, they've truly been on lockdown. Yeah. I mean, can't even walk outside for a while. Yeah, it's going (laughs) to – yeah. Yeah, and yeah, COVID stuff aside, but I, yeah, but but yeah, I, I'm just going to see this time as an adventure. I love. That. I don't think your only path is try to make mm-hmm. uh, 150 thousand so that you can afford a home in L.A. You know, uh, it's going to be hard to do a home in L.A. Uh, you know, with a typical income, considering the real estate prices are not typical. And so you, I mean, you're sitting about that household average in America. The good news is you're only 22, so you're going nowhere to go from here, but up usually. So good stuff there. But um, I just, I'd have some fun with this. Lee is in Chattanooga. Hi, Lee. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Better than I deserve. What's up? Um, my husband and I, we are debt free, and we are currently maxing out both of our Roths. And we have a, um, my husband has a simple um, IRA at work that he contributes to the match on it. Mm -hmm. And so I was just wondering what our 
what are our other options as far as investing for retirement and just regular investing in general? Mm, okay, very good. So I would max out anything that he's got at work. If he's got a simple and he's okay. only doing the match, then I would go ahead and take it all out to the max. That's the first thing mm-hmm. because it's a uh, a simple IRA is a 401k at a small company. Yeah. That's what it amounts to, and they have a mandatory 3% match. And so that that's what he's experiencing. He, they probably offer that in a Roth, and I'd be doing it in a Roth as well. So if you can do a simple with a match, fully funded as a Roth, and do your two Roths, that's the first step. Uh, or something that okay. sounds something like that. Uh, and are, and you're not working outside the home, Lee? I know I'm not. Okay. All right. Do either one of you have any self-employed income? Uh, no. Okay. All right. Uh, then you're left with just open market investing. Now, uh, what is your household income? Um, about 85. Okay. Well, we recommend putting 15% of your household income, which in your case, uh, a couple of Roths would do it. Um, Yeah, we're pretty much there now, but we've still got some extra that comes in. Well, I know, but do you have a, is your home paid off? It is, yes. Oh, okay. We did that in January. That's wonderful. Okay, then you're just left with investing. And, uh, you know, at this point, um, what what, what I would suggest you do is just open a, uh, probably you, something that's called a low turnover mutual fund. If you're working with a smart investor pro, they can help you with that. Another way to access uh-huh. a low turnover mutual fund is a, uh, just an S and P 500 index fund. Now I'll explain to you what that okay. means. Okay. Mm-hmm. If you buy a stock, a single stock, let's just say you bought, I'll make up a number, a $50 stock, and I'll call it Home Depot. I don't even know what Home Depot sells for, but let's just call, you bought the stock for $50. If it goes up in value from 50 to 70, you do not pay taxes on the seven, on the $20 increase until you sell it, right? Okay. It's a called a cap. Uh-huh. It's a it's a capital gain if you hold it more than a year. So it's taxed yeah. at less than regular income, and you don't pay taxes on it until you sell it. That's called realized but not recognized. You've realized the gain, but you've not had to recognize it for tax purposes. And uh, so, okay. if you buy a low turnover mutual fund, the mutual fund has a bunch of stocks in it, and they almost never sell them. If they have a 5% turnover ratio, 95% of them did not sell. And all of the growth on the 95% that did not sell is just like that $50 to $70. There's no tax due on it until you sell it. So the beauty of it is, is it's tax deferred capital gains growth in mutual funds, but it's not in a retirement plan. So it's, it's a good, okay. it's a very okay. tax efficient way to grow your money. I personally do that a lot. I dump a ton into index funds. And then when I get a chunk in there, I buy a piece of real estate that I pay cash for. And then I start again. Okay, gotcha. then, I, then I build it up okay. again because I like real estate. But if you just want yeah, to just... Well, that was maybe an option in the, you know, in the future once we get a chunk of money. So Yeah, if you had enough to pay cash for a little rental house there in Chattanooga, that'd be awesome, right? And get your real estate portfolio yeah. started. And that going along with your Roths and his simple, you're going to be in really, really good shape. And you don't have to do anything fancy. Again, a SmartVestor Pro, click SmartVestor at DaveRamsey.com. Any of you that are wanting to do your investing, they can show you how to do this stuff and teach you so you understand what you're doing. Never do something you don't understand. But that's how that works, and it's the most tax-efficient way uh, and a beautiful, beautiful way to do your, your surplus investing portion. Ken, good hour. Yeah, always fun. Good, good calls. Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, my co-host today. James Childs is our producer. Kelly Daniels, our associate producer and phone screener. I am Dave Ramsey, your host, and we'll be back. Did you know you can listen to The Ramsey Show on your smart speaker? Just tell Alexa, Google Assistant, or Siri to play The Ramsey Show podcast. Check out all Ramsey Network shows on your smart speaker today. This 
This is The Ramsey Show. You can be intentional about your character. You can have money and a career. You are the hero in your story. Live from the headquarters of Ramsey Solutions, broadcasting from the Dollar Car Rental Studios, it's The Ramsey Show, where debt is dumb, cash is king, and the paid-off home mortgage has taken the place of the BMW as the status symbol of choice. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host, Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, host of The Ken Coleman Show, is my co-host today. Open phones at 888-825-5225. That's 888 888- Eight two five five two two five. Ian starts us off this hour in Knoxville. Hi, Ian. Welcome to the Ramsey Show. Dave and Ken, thank you so much for having me on the show. How are you today? Better than we deserve. What's up, brother? All right, so I'm in the middle, almost halfway through a master's degree, and I'm taking on debt. If I continue, I will take on more debt. I know your policy on student loans and... I just happened to work at a job that, like, it, I'm a teacher at a private school, and in order for me to maintain my position here, I have to show that I'm making progress towards licensure through this master's program. My question is, do I stay in the master's degree and continue to take on debt, or should I get out of it but then have to look for a different job? What do you think? So the master's degree you're you're a, a high school teacher? Yes, sir. At a private school? No, sir. I'm a middle school teacher at a private person school. And they demand that you are going into debt and taking on uh, to get a master's degree to teach middle school kids. Well, they That's kind of ridiculous. Uh, show progress. It, <laughs> um, that's a good way of putting it. <laughs> yeah, these are 8th graders for God's sakes. I mean, I, I'm not against yeah. education, but this is a little bit onerous. So, uh, yeah, so, so how much debt have you yeah, taken on? All right. So, so far, I have eleven thousand two hundred dollars in debt, and if I continue, I estimate at least fifteen thousand additional dollars in debt. Mm-hmm. Okay. Are you married? Yes, sir. I am. Does your wife work outside the home? Uh, she has a job, but it's one that she can work from at home. She actually just got it. We're unsure. It's commission-based. So we're unsure what that's going to look like month to month. What do you make? So I make 32000 a year. Do middle school teachers in the public school system make more or less? Uh, they make more. I mean, the price varies. The amount varies by district, but overall it's more. Yeah. I was thinking Knox County would pay better than that. Mm-hmm. I, I got to ask here for clarification. Is this a part of your employee agreement when you signed on where they say you have to have continuing education to stay employed here? That's correct. Well, what's the long-term goal for you as a teacher? Where, where do you want to end up? Well, what's it look like in the future? Where are you headed? Well, for this is kind of what I'm thinking through right now. For many years, I wanted to be a teacher. Um, my wife and I, we've just started to get out of debt and we were reading through one of your books, Dave. And so we want to be we want to have financial freedom, obviously. And I've just read and heard over and over that you are like you're against student you're against debt of any you know, in any form. And and like I'm willing to do whatever it takes. I'm like if I have to find a different job, like I will. Uh, if it's worth it to continue, like, well, this is not about this too. is not about me. This is about what gives you your best life a decade from now. And is that student mm-hmm. loan debt? Is it this career track? Is it this place that you're working in? Um, aside from anything you've learned from us, um, just commenting, you know, just as your friend looking in from the outside, you are underpaid in a private school setting, what you could be paid mm-hmm. in a public school setting, and they're putting extra rules on you that make it super unreasonable. Um, that's mm-hmm. aside from Dave Ramsey or Ramsey Solutions things. I, am, I, am I missing something, Ken? No, I, I mean, the question I was asking is, Ian, do you want to be in education long term? Uh, because that kind of plays into this. I would certainly pause the master's degree. I well, would. Where pa- do you want to be in 10 years? Yeah. Like in terms of my job? Yeah. yeah. I mean, up until 
this year, I thought it was it was teaching, but after going through the numbers, I'm like, like I could be paid, I could get paid way more and provide for my family and still do something I enjoy for less hassle. Yeah, but here, here I want to caution you on that, and I understand those emotions. But but if you always felt the call to be a teacher and you want to instruct, you love instructing, uh, then number one, you can make more than you're making right now. Mm-hmm. Number two, uh, we have a study, the largest study ever of net worth millionaires, and the third largest group of net worth millionaires in the United States are teachers. So you can take care of your family. You can retire a millionaire. So if that's true and you believe that, would that give you reason to leave being a teacher? You said, would that be reason to... Yeah, to my, my point is, if, if, if you know you could take care of your family and retire a millionaire, would that make you want to leave being a teacher? If you knew you could provide and take care and, and re- entire, retire wealthy, would you leave? Like, it, it would definitely make like make me consider it much more as an option, yes. uh, knowing that does help. So right. I, I think you need to look at being a teacher somewhere else. That's right. You're doing the right thing in okay. the wrong place. And Mm -hmm. so you need to, if they're going to fire you upon quitting, which I don't know how stringent this is, then you need a plan. I don't want you jumping here. But if it were me, I'd pause and move on to another middle school teacher. Start talking to the county and the city school system about coming on there or another private school. And you maybe you're working your way up to, I I don't know, what are the best paid teachers in the land? How do you do this? And what I I know I have a friend that's um, in a county school system that made $90,000 a year, 30 years with a master's degree, but a specialized area of teaching, not just in the, the traditional classroom, uh, but in a public school system uh, working with, um, you know, K through 12. And so uh, not to reveal any more than that, but uh, um, and so, uh, you know, uh, my aunt taught at Farragut. And I don't know what she made, but she was there for 38 years, right around the corner from you mm-hmm. there. So I know the school system there, and I know Knoxville. And uh, so do you want to be teaching middle schoolers, high schoolers? Where's the best money? Where's the best reward for you psychologically, spiritually? What's God asking you to do with, while you're on the planet? Uh, or do you continue your education path and even at some point with a Ph.D. end up in a college classroom? Uh, which I suspect pays more than yes. uh, the high school classroom. I don't know for sure. It would depend on the college versus which high school. But I think you develop a path that is not $32,000 with a forced set of rules um, 10 years from now. Uh, it could be you stay there for a year and you ask them for some mercy because you're having to stop your master's. You know, right now you don't have the money to complete it. Uh, and you ask them for a little mercy. In the meantime, you start looking for a job and move to a different teaching gig. That's probably what I'm going to do. But I want to kind of start thinking about what does the mountain look like? Yes. What does the path on the mountain look like? And what's the top of the mountain look like? And as Ken, Ken talks about that, to get clear on where you're going, get promoted yes. along the way. But you, you need to develop a, a system. I'm going to work this many years in high school, this many years in the college classroom, this many years. I don't care where you want to end up or where God's telling you to end up. But I think that this has revealed not a lack of burden for teaching, but a bad situation. Yes. What makes our show unique is that we genuinely care about our listeners. We're intentional about choosing the best advertisers to recommend. Blinds.com is no exception. They offer high quality window treatments at unbelievable prices, and they make it simple to shop blinds, shades, and interior shutters with easy online ordering, free shipping, and a guaranteed perfect fit. Go to blinds.com and take advantage of this week's special savings.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personalities, my co-host today. This is The Ramsey Show. We're so glad you're with us. Open phones at 888-825-5225. This is common sense for your dollars and cents. Ken and I are the two ornery uncles that will give you the advice you always needed. (laughs) (laughs) I like that. You never know. Everybody had some ornery uncles, right? Ornery Uncle Ken. I'm going to own that with my niece and nephews. Ornery Uncle Ken. There we go. That's a new one. Summer is with us. Summer is uh, in Cincinnati. Hi, Summer. How are you? I'm great. How are you guys doing today? Better than we deserve. What's up? So glad to be talking to the two um, uncles. Yes, <laughs> it's like two of those old men Muppets. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my question is: um, My father-in-law passed away a few months ago, mm. and um, since that time, my mother-in-law has been um, dealing with her finances on her own. They have plenty of money. They've never had debt, and they're very blessed. Um, which she called my husband last week and told him that she wanted to gift us $20,000 to put toward a dissenting to her kids. We're having trouble hearing you, Summer. Can you speak directly into your phone? She wants to give you $20,000 to do what? She wants to give us $20,000 to put toward an above-ground pool for the kids and also a barn for my husband because he is inheriting a workshops full of tools and equipment and other things. Um, so my first reaction was, uh, we're in baby step two, by the way. Um, we should be finished with baby step two in October. We've been on the journey for 15 months. We have $21,000 left to go. Yeah. So I thought we should take the money and put it toward baby step two um, because we were going to save in the future for the other items. She wants to Your phone is all over the place. We're having real trouble hearing you. If you can oh, stabilize okay. her somehow, it'd be great. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, so I thought we should put the money towards baby step two. My husband thinks that we should use the money um, as my mother-in-law has um, given us her wishes. What do you think? I think you shouldn't take the money. Okay. At all. Here's what's okay. going on. Your husband and his mom are grieving they're hurting and they're not thinking clearly okay he's 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 lost his dad he's got all his dad's tools coming that he probably used to work in the garage with his dad and that brings back a lot of memories and he's trying to rebuild that portion of that memory because of it because he's, he's hurting he lost his dad and how long were how long were your mother in law and him married Fifteen years. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, she she just lost like her her right arm and her right leg. You know, I mean, I've been married to Sharon thirty eight years. I don't need to be making decisions like this two months after Sharon's gone. My brain's not going to be working right. good. And your your mother in law okay. your mother in law is a very sweet person, and she's hurting deeply. Okay. And so you need to love her gently and kindly. And just say, you know what, this is not a good time for us, and it's not a good time for her. And by the way, even your husband, you need to tell that too, and he needs to take care of his mom. You don't need to say a word to her, because you'll get painted in the ungrateful daughter-in-law position if you're not careful. Okay. Yeah, she's just hurting, honey. And because this is, truthfully, her suggestions are ridiculous. The last thing you need is more expenses while you're in debt. And an above-the-ground pool does not add value to anything. It's useless for the property. It's good for fun, but it does not add value to the property. It may, as a matter of fact, detract value from the property. Um, And it has to be maintained. The money I spend on my in-the-ground pool makes me want to throw up per hour we swim in it. You know? It's crazy. Okay. You don't need an extra expense right now. Well, we'll do it with our own chemicals. Well, you got to buy the freaking chemicals, and you got to go out there and spend the hours dealing with the thing. Uh, for a lot less, you can take your kids to the to the another pool and put them in somebody else's problem. And uh, um, this is just her hurting and her wanting to express love, and she just um, 
doesn't doesn't know how right now, and it's completely inappropriate. And the and the and the conclusions that they're all coming to are silly. Okay. But it's but okay. it's all it's all sweet and it's all love, and it's all because the, he he was probably just a great dad, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. Yeah. Fifty years. Of course, I. Yeah, I know. I will have my husband talk to her then, and then we will tell her now at the right time. Yeah, I just think it's a bad idea, and and I think she wants to do something that she can see the family enjoy, and getting you out of debt is not something she can see and do that with, and you guys just plow on through the debt, and then later on when you get ready to do something, if she wants to give you a gift to do something for the kids and with the kids, I mean, I'm trying to channel my inner John Deloney. Mm. And what are you thinking? Well, I absolutely think you're right here in this situation. There are strings attached to this gift. And when so there are strings not really attached, a gift. it's really not a gift. It's got all kinds of conditions. Uh, it puts you in a situation where maybe your husband and you could be at odds because you guys have been walking out baby step two. If I heard you correctly, you're out mm-hmm. of debt in October, so you can mm-hmm. see the finish line. Mm-hmm. I think you're right. Yeah. But just, I think the most important advice you gave was that the husband needs to, A, be on board with Summer, and he needs to deliver that news. I thought that was – because she doesn't win if she delivers that. No, there's no, there's almost no mother-in-law in the world that's going <laughs> to love that coming. For that. No. Just, I mean, that's just a hard thing. And so, yeah. you know, because – and he doesn't even need to reference Summer when he delivers the message. That's he the just key. Needs to say, you know, Mom, I appreciate this, but I'm hurting right now with Dad's passing. I know you are. And it's just a bad timing. Let's just yep. let's just put this on hold. We'll look at doing it later, maybe, and just be very kind and very gentle because she's really grieving, and and not grieving well, by the way. Uh, when you start throwing money around like this, right in the face of a loss after fifty years, it's it's a bad sign for how she's handling this. So she may need to sit down with a pastor, with a good counselor, and just start to walk through the all the pain because it's legitimate, real pain. I mean, this is this hurts, and um, you don't make financial decisions in a vacuum ever. You're always affected by your emotions. You're always affected by your relationships. You're always affected by your career status. Everything around you is a variable affecting your financial decisions. So there's no one that makes financial decisions based purely on math. It never happens. There's always something going on, and yes. it could be good things or it could be horrible things, tragedies like this. Joy is with us. Joy is in San Diego. Hi, Joy. How are you? I am well. So happy to talk to you guys. You too. Um, Thank you. We have a home that we raised our kids in, and it is just, we own it. We own it outright. We are debt-free. Thank you very much, Dave Ramsey. Way to go. Uh huh. And we, I'm ready to sell, and my husband is too, but he keeps going back and forth. Okay. You know the housing market here market here is great. Mm-hmm. We can get a nice penny for our home mm-hmm. and walk away with the money to buy another home. We cannot buy back into Southern California because it costs too much. We are considering buying in Michigan, but then maybe buying back in Southern California when the market goes down. The question is, my husband says maybe we should keep our home and rent it. No. And then look. We'll Okay, why? No, because you don't need to be long-distance landlording. If you're moving out of this house, it's time to sell it. Um, But I'm I'm confused. If you sell a home in Southern California, why can you not buy a home in Southern California with that money? (laughs) Because that's pretty much going to be our retirement, although we do have a nice nest egg. Okay, so you're not, not, it's not the Southern California thing. It's you don't want to put the money back into a house. And then that's pushing you out of Southern California. So I think you ought to sell it, but I think you probably ought to look at just buying another house there. I think you live there. Um, and if you're wanting to downsize or right size or something, I'd probably do that. But um, I would not move out of it and rent it. That's not going to work. It's not a rental house. It's your home.
Ken Coleman, Ramsey personality, is my co-host today here on The Ramsey Show. I'm Dave Ramsey, your host. Open phones at 888 825 Two two five in Orlando, Florida. Beth is on her on the line to do her debt-free scream. Hey, Beth. Hi. How you doing? I'm so excited to be in your show, and this has been amazing. So, and I wanted to share with everyone. That's why I write an email, and I wanted to for people to know how much how debt I did, did you pay off, Beth? Hundred twenty-one thousand. I love it. How long did this take you? Oof, it took me. Five years, around five years, and I can tell that I started, um, I have a friend that's listening right now. She introduced me to Dave Ramsey, the plan, Mm -hmm. and she spoke to me at at work, and I'm like, okay, what's that? I I have all this debt. I don't know how to do it, and I was always struggling. I came from Puerto Rico with zero, with nothing, with my daughter, escaping from a domestic violence relationship. Wow. To live in a shelter. I used to live in a shelter to protect myself and my wow. daughter. And when I came with nothing, um, I was like struggling like like a single mom with just a job with a thousand dollars back then. And when I started the plan, my salary was around, I would say like 52,000. Mm-hmm. What is it now? Kind of like, uh, right now I'm 68. What do you do? I work for a sheriff's office Mm -hmm. in Central Florida. Mm -hmm. I'm right now a community services uh, coordinator. I also am a public information officer for the state of Florida. Mm, And I'm in that law enforcement. I teach self-defense classes. And and you save lots of women who are (laughs) facing, and you save lots of women who are facing domestic violence like you used to. Correct. I opened, uh, when I started here, I didn't know English at all. I learned the language. I created a nonprofit to help and assist uh, other women that are going through domestic violence. It's called Life in Your Hands. And I'm here today death free because of you, and I'm so thankful. And I would say that that $1,000 made for me everything because that was the first step for me, the $1,000. And I say, okay, I can save money. How am I going to do it? I start cutting things, using the envelope uh, uh, system. I remember my friends used to make fun of me because wherever I went, I was I had the envelopes. And it was fun because that was my goal. I say that before 50, I wanted to pay it off my house. And I did it with a lot of sacrifices. Wait a minute, you, this is your house you paid off? I paid off everything, my car, my <laughs> student loan, the house. What's this uh, house? What's your house worth? Uh, right now, it's around 180 So from homeless in a shelter mm-hmm. due to yeah. domestic violence to $1,000 to a $180,000 paid-for house, a new career, and new language skills all in five years. You are an amazing woman. <laughs> oh, but no, but I, I got here before that, <laughs> many years ago. But um, in five years, I started everything, like the process with you. The oh, day I see, I see. Uh, that, okay. Yeah, no, but that took me longer. <laughs> Learning a language is difficult. But I'll say that I follow everything. I paid the, the using the snowball. And I've been telling everyone I see everywhere because I did a video and I shared it in my social media that when I paid off the house and I wanted people to know that your plan really works. And and the way it it requires a lot because you have to sacrifice different things or trips or vacations. But I'll say that from all the steps, the hardest one for me was the three to six months expenses Hmm. um but because it was little by little trying to get that money and get it all together how's it feel now that you're completely debt free i accomplished i'm gonna a big this is for me it's been everything because i wanted to show my daughters that you can do it that you can live debt free because i remember when i pay off my car when i was i i was planning to pay off the car Someone from the family say, why are you paying that car? You need to make payments monthly. So if something happened, why are you going to spend all that money paying off the car? I say, I don't want to have no debt. And they couldn't understand what is living mm. debt free. And for me, it was kind of like that 
made me kind of like that encouraged me mm-hmm. to keep going, keep going and say, no, I can do it. Everyone's <laughs> all, they have all debt. Everyone has something they have to pay and I want to live debt free. And the other thing was my retirement. My, I have the actual retirement from the state. And in addition to that, following your baby step, um, I added a 457 tax deferred plan. (laughs) So I have two. (laughs) So you are going to be the first millionaire in your family. I don't know about that, but I'm working on it. Well, you're sitting with a $200,000 paid for house and you're loading up your retirement. You're only 50 years old. I think you're going to make it. No, I'm 47. No, yet, no, yet. Uh-oh, uh-oh. You put three extra years on there, Dave. Uh-oh, uh-oh. No, no, that's no good. You're, st- you're still going to make it. You're still going to make that's it. That's right. Beth, what well, does your family think now? Those people who are saying, why would you do that? Why would you do that? Now they've seen you on the other side. What kind of impact is it having? Uh, for my family, they were so thrilled. And my friends, mm-hmm. as I say, I did a video. I recorded a video on my way to the bank to pay off the house. <laughs> and um, I, I documented everything on my way there. And I kind of like uh, gave my testimony how God from nothing, zero, came here to the States with nothing and where he placed me now. And as my testimony, kind of like I shared it with everyone, the video I edited, I had pictures and all that, shared it with everyone. And I even wrote it for a newspaper and the feedback was amazing. Yeah, uh, sure. People kind of like sending messages well, you're just, that they you're wanted inspiring. to do the same thing. Your, your <laughs> yes. whole life is inspiring. I'm inspired. You're so impressive. <laughs> well done. And they, they all asked me like how I did it, and I definitely say they ran <laughs> the baby steps, and I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful for your blessing. You and are. And keep doing what you're doing because it really blessed us. Wow, you're an incredible lady. Yes. I'm so honored to uh, get to talk to you today. Absolutely incredible. Very well done. So uh, are you ready to do the debt-free scream, Beth? I'm ready. All right. I'm, I have a request in Spanish. Okay. I don't care. You can okay. say it, you say it in <laughs> German. Time. I don't care. <laughs> $121,000 paid off. House and everything at a mere 47 years old. Did it in five years, making 52 to 68. A life completely transformed. Count it down, Beth. Let's hear a debt-free scream. Three, two, one. One, estoy libre de deudas. Yeah, I like that. I love it. Yeah, man, what a story! Unbelievable. What a life. What an arc. I mean, that's incredible. And you know, we find when we did the millionaire study, we find more people like her than we do some kind of blue blood. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, went to Harvard and, you know, had had all kinds of uh, advantages or something. We find, we, the, as a matter of fact, people who come to this country legally are four times more likely to become millionaires than Americans are that grew up here. And it's because they believe it is the land of opportunity. They believe in the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. Well, you know, one of the powerful things for everybody that becomes debt free are the baby steps is just a clear path for people. And they say, wait a second, there's an opportunity to live debt free. And she caught that opportunity from a coworker. To your point, she believed in it. And there's no stopping anybody. There's no the human stopping spirit her. spirit is alive Holy, and man. well. Holy, there ain't any stopping that woman. Uh-uh. She's incredible. Yeah, that's great. Beautifully done, Beth. Beautifully done. So proud of you. You're an absolute rock star. This is The Ramsey Show.
Our scripture of the day, Isaiah 41, 13, for I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not. I am the one who helps you. Brian Tracy said, failure is a prerequisite for great success. If you want to succeed faster, double your rate of failure. Well, this is true. This is true. Ah, so how many of you guys are stressed out or hurting because your retirement savings scared you to death last year? Well, if you're in that kind of pain, you may need to have someone to help you with your confidence by teaching you, and that would be a SmartVestor Pro. You don't have to let 2020 kill your confidence. Text INVEST to 33789. Find an investment pro in your area. Never again face a global crisis alone. Text INVEST to 33789. This is the Dave Ramsey Show. Thank you for joining us, America. Ken Coleman, Ramsey Personality, is my co-host today. Joel or Joel is with us in San Juan. Hi, Joel. How are you? Hi, I'm doing great. How are you guys? Better than I deserve. What's up? Yeah, I was uh, calling because uh, me and my wife have been kind of stuck in this dilemma between uh, deciding and investing um, and what would be essentially an investment property or uh, building our first house. Um, so basically the question is, would you guys recommend buying a multifamily house where basically we'll be living upstairs and renting the bottom apartments or build on a plot of land that we own um, but still owe on because uh, we recently bought this uh, plot of land? Okay, so you would build what on the plot of land? A single family? So there's nothing. There's no. There's nothing yet. What would on you the build on it? So a single family? Yeah. Okay. So the question is, at the end of the story, do we end up with a single family or uh, living upstairs in a multifamily that we rent out? Right. Okay. How old are you? Um, I'm 25. And what's your household income? We are currently at approximately eighty-five thousand. Okay. All right. And um, you have children? Nope. Uh, but we do plan on having, uh, well, in the next few years, hopefully. Okay. All right. Well, quality of life would be the single family. Investing with a lower quality of life would be living in upstairs in the multifamily and having your tenants next door. Right. The great news is your tenants are next door. The bad news is your tenants are next door. <laughs> yeah. And from a landlord's perspective, it, it's um, not always a beautiful thing. So, um, I mean, you got the people all up in your business, and you're all up in their business uh, while you're trying to do life. Uh, now, if you had kids, I would push you even more towards a single family from a quality of life standpoint. But purely on the investment side alone, not considering lifestyle or quality of life, uh, the multifamily will make more sense. You'll make more money that way, but mm -hmm. but it's going to be a pain in the butt. That's part of the deal. I mean, you're you're giving up some things to do that. And um, uh, I can tell you this: I've owned a whole bunch of investment real estate. There has not been a piece of investment real estate that my wife was wanting to live in. <laughs> so I've never right. done what you're talking about, and I own several hundred million dollars worth of real estate today. And I started out like you started out here, you know, with my very first one. So uh, it's not a, it's not an evil, bad thing for you to build a house on that piece of land, get it paid off, uh, save up your money, and buy your first rental as somewhere else. And it's not an evil and bad thing to move in that multifamily for a little while, pile up a bunch of cash, and then build a piece of build a house somewhere, or buy a house somewhere, and move out and rent that other pro apartment out after you get it all paid off. But uh, it's just a matter of how you all want to live, and you need to be real sure you're listening to the, to the wife on this. Yeah, I'd pull off the paper with all the math numbers, and I'd say, what's this really going to be like? And, and you know, it sounds really good. And Walk up you, there and stand <laughs> in that apartment a little yeah, bit. That's right. Just listen to the noises. Yeah, if, and if you've lived that way before, and, you, and it's essentially like you're the, uh, you know, you've, you've rented out multiple apartments, and you're the super supervisor. So yeah. I, if you can do with that, I, if the wife is on board, sure. John is in Boise, Idaho. Hey, John, what's up? Dave, Kim, thanks so much for taking my call. I was hoping that you guys could help me out. I am trying to figure out if I'm using math to justify a stupid decision. 
So uh, I'm about to graduate from law school and also with a master's in accounting and tax. I'm going to finish with only about $8,000 in student loan debt that wow. I unfortunately had to get with uh, COVID last year. So well, thank you. Um, I am p- planning to pay that off within the first couple months of starting my job. I've got a great job lined up. Sure. I'm going to be making six figures starting out, which I'm really excited about. And I'm you. looking to buy a house. I'm not in a position to have a large down payment, though. And I was wondering, mathematically, being here in Boise, rent prices have gone through the roof. I think we were one of the highest in the nation to see an increase in rent prices. And just overall, property values have been going through the roof as well. Yep. I was wondering if it would be appropriate for me to you know, get a mortgage or something with a 3.5% down payment and get PMI for a few years knowing how fast property values are going up or you know, my Dave Ramsey alarm is going off in the back of my head, wondering if I should go the more traditional route and get a, you know, save up a full 20% down payment, if not more. We don't, and just we don't have as a, don't as a Ramsey rule that you put down 20% on your first house. It just saves you PMI. Okay. That's all it does. And okay. we just want people to understand that because, you know, the culture has gone, uh, you know, buy a house when you're broke and we don't want you to do that. So I, I do mm-hmm. want you to get the student loan paid off and have your emergency fund plus some down payment above your emergency fund. But a 5% down on a 95% Fannie Mae conventional loan uh, will be the cheapest route to go. You're still going to have the PMI, but it'll drop off when you pay it down to an 80% loan to value. Um, and mm. you can do that in just a few years with your great income. So, yeah, I'm probably doing that, but I'm not going to do more than a 15-year, and I'm not going to do a payment that's more than a fourth of your take-home pay, and I'm not, uh, you know, and but if you put 5% down instead of 20% down on a conventional and you have your emergency fund in place and you're debt-free, I don't have any issue with it. Okay. Well, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I really appreciate the insight. Yeah, but just keep in mind, you're paying a premium, you know that, on that PMI. That PMI is a ripoff. Yeah, absolutely, and I, I wouldn't do it. I've, I've worked out the math. and I'm, It's not a math thing. Value. It's a, it's just a stupid insurance thing that they make you buy, yeah. and you want to get rid of it because you're getting screwed as quick as you can. That's the thing, but it's not, okay. you know, it's not a matter of, I, I, I don't, I don't, I just tell people, you know, go ahead and buy the house, but get the rid of the stinking PMI as fast as you can, uh, mm-hmm. because it's just foreclosure insurance that you're buying to protect the mortgage company it pays them if they have to foreclose on you and lose money. That's all it is. You're buying them foreclosure insurance and it's 75 to a hundred dollars a month per hundred thousand borrowed. And so it's, it's a lot. And, and, um, so you know, that, that's the process you're in. And, uh, uh, but uh, yeah, we don't have a hard and fast rule of 20% down, uh, f- especially for first time home buyers. I would hold to that second, third. I think you just need to behave. But uh, where you're kicking out, right, you're starting your life off, you know, coming out of school. What a great job, though. Only $8,000 in student loan debt. Yeah, really fantastic to come out with that kind of degrees and a master's plus the law degree. And he is going to crush that in two months. And the sky's the limit. Uh, you're, but you're not opposed to him saying, all right, maybe I'll wait a little bit. Or do you think because skyrocketing prices, because he can do it, and you've already explained that, yeah. but he also could wait and not necessarily It's not, it's not the crushed. end of the world to wait. It's not, yeah. He's not wrong. And I, I think we get the emotions of skyrocketing prices are greater than the actual prices. That's what they I was They are skyrocketing. Yeah. This market's white hot. It is. I mean, there's, uh, we're experiencing the same thing in our area here. Lots of these markets are experiencing this. It's just blistering white yeah. hot i've never seen anything like it yep. uh rental market is full and jammed here and shooting up fast and certainly the for sale market is jammed here and and it is in boise boise is a hot market so there, there's a bunch of these markets out there that are that way right now but just because something goes like that doesn't mean you walk into the land of stupid you still do it with the basics in place which is what we outlined for john there well done john good job brother That puts this hour of the Dave Ramsey Show in the books. We'll be back with you before you know it. In the meantime, remember, there's ultimately only one way to financial peace, and that's to walk daily with the Prince of Peace, Christ Jesus. Hey, it's Kelly, associate producer and phone screener for The Ramsey Show. If you would like to do your debt-free screen live on the show, make sure you visit theramseyshow.com and register. 
We would love for you to come to Nashville and tell Dave your story.